Hello everyone, uh, myself Paras and uh, my colleague Kiran from IBM will today be covering our short beginner's guide on observability and specifically uh, its observability with uh, open telemetry. So in this presentation, uh, we'll be discussing how currently developer and companies are modernizing uh, their applications and we'll then quickly move our focus towards what, why and the three pillars of the observability followed by the open telemetry specification, and then we'll cover some of the commonly used terminologies in this area, like span, span context, and the data models of the traces. We'll end the presentation with a short demo that shows how the tracing with Yager works uh, with a small microservices application that we currently have, and conclude it with a short summary. So we'll quickly come on um, to the modernizing application. So there has been a wider adoption of microservices in our application. Services that communicate with their counterpart services running in different platforms like private cloud, public cloud, etc. Uh, it has become immensely important to track down the request uh, and flowing through the different components of our application. Similarly, there has been increase of the adoption of the DevOps practices. Uh, the DevOps being uh, adopted by almost all the organizations now because it increases the ability to deliver the application at much higher velocity than it's being done otherwise. Uh, but with this velocity, it also becomes important to trace the performance of our application. Uh, with all the new DevOps practices, microservice style, and the hybrid cloud coming in, it becomes very important to introduce the observability in our application. Uh, Observability is one of a uh, very critical component of any application that uh, uh, that tends to understand the bottlenecks of our, our application products or even services running across uh, across the hybrid clouds. Now we'll uh, quickly cover uh, what basically is observability is. So uh, the observability is not a new concept. It's been there with us in in different forms. So in physics and control theory, observability used to be a measure of how well internal states of a system can be inferred from the knowledge of its uh, external output. Uh, there is also a notion that uh, the evolution of monitoring, the evolution of uh, monitoring services, be it microservices or, or various other components that we are working on, has led us to the uh, observability. And that's because the new technologies like Docker, Kubernetes, containers, OpenShift, et cetera, uh, and various new practices uh, has helped us in enhancing the performance of our software products. And it has considerably reduced the friction between the dev, pre-prod, and prod environment. But at the same time, uh, the greater complexity uh, in our product has been introduced. And for that to handle, we have introduced the observability. This observability helps us to uh, understand or debug the rare or infrequent uh, path that, that our request takes. So there are some uh, infrequent paths that are often taken by the request that mostly uh, are not encountered in the normal logging environment. Similarly, it also helps us to gain the insight across the application. So if there are any hidden patterns or any hidden paths being followed, so we can easily determine that uh, from the observability. So uh, there's also been a notion that why do we need observability? And the one big one big reason for that that often comes is the uh, is the introduction of the multi-layered architecture. So it helps the developer to understand multi-layered architectures. It shares information on what's slow, what's broken, and what needs to be done to enhance. Or you can say improve the overall performance, which which particular component is most likely contributing towards the latency right now in our application. It is not just knowing about a population, but it is uh, also about why the problem is happening, what change has been introduced in our existing application, and why it was changed, what was the reason behind that. Is that feature uh, really worth to have because it's uh, impacting the performance of our application uh, with a good amount of latency. So these are some of the most important questions that are uh, answered uh, 
by the observability and uh, it's it's something that helps us to determine who is contributing to the overall latency of our application so it is defined as the measure of internal state uh, based on the output and the outputs in our case are the uh, logs events and traces and these are often known as the three pillars of observability a uh, logs are the record of some activity that has happened somewhere at some point in time and they are uh, immutable time stamp record of discrete events that has happened over the time so we all know logs we have been using the logs uh, widely in our, in our application these are some of the most uh, commonly used uh, one of the most essential attribute of any application uh, uh, right logging at the uh, right log statements whenever there is a uh, action being initiated by a user or by a process we add a log similarly events are focused on the periodic measurement of information that allows you to have an idea of the overall state uh, this could be like a disk space cpu usage or number of processes of our system uh even for in fact you, with events you can harness the uh, mathematical modeling and prediction to derive the knowledge of the behavior of a system over an interval of time for example you can use the events to generate a weekly monthly or a quarterly report to see how well your cpu and various other processes are being used and and you can have a, a a prediction based on the events like if there has been uh, x number of resources being used uh, during certain time interval so we can uh, have that prediction and accordingly we can increase or decrease our cpu memory so that we have sufficient resources available to meet the demand now the third point which is interesting here is the traces so distributed tracing enables you to analyze the performance through your microservice architecture all in one view and this is accomplished by tracing all the requests that is from the very beginning an initial web request from the web ui was initiated till it completes its processing at the very end traces are used to identify the amount of work that has been done at the each and uh, different layer so that's where the traces plays an uh, crucial part for us so to summarize uh, uh, in in short logs and metrics uh, logs are about what happened and when it happened however the events are about collecting the information periodically and traces are about identifying the amount of work done at each layer now it's always good to have all these three in our components but the challenge lies in integrating all these three across the different components that we have services of an application like there will be different services being used in different components and it becomes uh, quite challenging for the different service provider and the uh, uh, service provider application to have a single tracing vendor so like everyone will have their own choices and everybody wants to use their own uh, uh, own set of tracing uh, tracing application so and the the uh, the use case of tracing is basically that from the very beginning till the very end we have a single flow which is being tracked by the tracing application so to overcome this uh that's when uh, the open telemetry comes in so open telemetry provides the library agents and other components that we need to capture uh, from our service so that we can observe manage and debug the requests that are going on it's basically a semantic specification to have a vendor neutral api providing distributed tracing so that uh, anyone or any application who have the open telemetry specification being followed are good to go so one such example in our case is the yager so they do uh, follow the open tracing uh, uh, specification and that's what uh, we have been using in our demo purpose as well so there are three major components or you can say three critical aspects of the open tracing specification uh, they are named as tracer span and span context so open tracing as you mentioning defines an api 
through which application instrumentation can log data to a pluggable tracer. Uh, Open tracing lays out some of the standard like uh, standardized PAM, PAM management, uh, how the uh, the process communicates when they are uh, crossing the different states, uh, how the active span management is being done, how the inter and intra process propagation being handled. So these are the some of the guidelines, some of the specification being laid out by the open tracing specification. But apart from that, there are three critical and interrelated types in the open tracing specification. The first one being the trace. So the description of a transaction as it moves through a distributed system is what is being handled by the trace. So it's basically whenever there is a transaction which goes from one layer to the another is being uh, traced out by the by the tracer. Now the second one is the span and uh, this is one of the most widely used term or one of the most important term that will come across many a times while, while implementing uh, open tracing for your application. So it's a name time operation which is representing a piece of the workflow. It accepts key value pair, it has timestamps within it, it has structure loss, locks attached to it uh, for a particular instance and it carries a lot more information. We'll covering it in more detail later on. Uh, the next important part is the span context. So span context is basically uh, uh, when the trace information uh, accompanies any distributed transaction included when it passes from the one service to the another over a network or for a message bus or in any other uh, architecture. The span context contains the trace identifier, the span identifier, and any other data that tracing system needs to propagate to the downstream services. So there might be uh, one span which is uh, initiating a uh, few more spans, like, uh, like there is a, a parent-child relationship between them, or there is a follows-off relationship between them where a one process triggers another process, process action. So that's one of the places where span context comes in. Like I was saying, a span context is one of the most widely used terms that you'll come across a lot in this tracing world. So we'll see what the tracing, what the span is in much more detail. Like we've been saying, uh, it's the primary building block of a distributed trace. Representing an individual unit of work done the distributed system. Uh, one of the uh, one of the good thing about this plan is it encapsulates the following states inside it, and these are like operation name, the start timestamp, the finish timestamp, and then key value pairs in form of span tags. A set of zero or more key value tags can be added, and they become very useful if you want some additional information to be added on this. Uh, the operation name that we've been specifying is like each span has a certain uh, has a certain operation to perform. Like in our case, uh, in the diagram shown here, there is a DB query that has been fired. So at time t is equal to zero, the DB query was fired, and at time t is equal to x, the DB query was finished. So this helps us to understand how much time this particular span, how much time this particular operation took to complete. Uh, so this is mostly how span uh, contributes in the tracing to understand the flow, to understand how much time a particular action of the user or the or the or the program has taken to complete. Uh, and like and the previously was saying, for so span context, uh, each span context encapsulates uh, the state like from where it has been originated. Uh, from where uh, where lies the uh, origin of uh, the span context. So we'll cover it in a bit more detail. So references between the span is like is where the span context coming to the picture. A span may reference zero or more span context that are casually created. So these are the like relationship like uh, child of and follows from. So in the layman term, it's like you have a uh, you have a one process which uh, which triggers two two child processes in it. So it could be an ORM which is then uh, initiating a couple of SQL queries in the database and then 
inside the DB, it, it, it is making a couple of transaction logs to make sure that database follows the all the ACID guidelines that the normal RDBMS has. So for that, this is the, how the child of relationship will look like. So a span may be child of a parent span, and in a child of reference, the parent span depends on the child span in some capacity. So in like in our example, we mentioned that the ORM database will depend on the, the SQL query, which is its child span in some capacity. So unless the child is finished, the parent will wait for that operation to terminate. So if the time span of a child span gets extended, so it will uh, also impact the, the, the timing of the uh, parent span as well. So this will uh, contribute towards how the entire data model of the tracing looks like. Similarly, uh, follows from reference, it's like it don't it do not depend in uh, in any way like the child span has, but it's more of a follows but it more of a follows from relationship that the parent that the child has with the parent. So it's kind of in a casual sense, uh, but it's still improving. And as we go further, uh, as the more development happens in this area, we can expect some more clear definition on the follows from references. So. Uh, the the child of references is what's uh, mostly used among uh, everyone, and it's quite popular everywhere. So that's the open tracing data model, how it looks like, and hopefully this this will clear much more. This will give a better clarity on how the the these uh, these references looks like when they are working. So, for example, the first figure that we have that's the casual relationship between the spans. So the span A is the root span as it's here, and it then triggers the two child spans, span B and span C. Span C is a child of span A. Now you can see that uh, span C further initiated two child spans, span E and span F, and then span F, span G was initiated by F, and H was initiated by span G, and they are following kind of a follows from relationship. So span B and span C are the child of span A, that was the one relationship. And then span H is followed from span G. Uh, so that's uh, another uh, reference that we were talking about. So if you can, if you want to visualize, you can visualize it in the form of a process where you have a main application which then uh, concurrently triggers two processes. You can say that the main program, uh, program A, uh, concurrently uh, Starts process B and process C, and then they continue. They, they continue to serve their uh, application. They continue to serve their microservices in their different uh, in their different features that they currently have. The second figure that we have currently, uh, it's more of a, of a time diagram where timeline which says that how much time span A took to complete. And span B was the child of span A. So it definitely it has contributed to the overall performance of span A. Span B then was a child of span B, and so on and so forth. So span C has been there parallel to the span B. So you can see that B and C are uh, child of A. So the temporal relationship between the spans is not there to see what the relationship is there among the different spans, but rather it's about to conclude how much time each span has taken. Uh, which particular operation was more efficient when compared to the other. And that's the one major uh, major reason of using the temporal relationship in, in this spam. So figure one shows casual relationship between the span in a single trace, and figure two visualizes the trace with the time axis as shown in the diagram. In both the diagrams, you can see how the different spans are related to each other uh, and how they are helping us to understand the operation name, start and finish finish timestamp, duration of each operation and how they have contributed to their uh, to their parents or their parent span. So now we will quickly move on to the uh, to the next section. Uh, so we'll be covering a short demo and which should tell you uh, how it overall looks like 
how the Jaeger interacts with uh, with the with the application that we currently have in place. So for the demo purpose, uh, we'll be using the two Dockerized container images. One has the Jaeger server running in the backend, and another one has the uh, has the hot rod application. The hot rod is basically a ride on demand services. So I have both the Docker in my machine locally available. I'll I'll start the Docker server for the for the Jaeger backend first, and then I'll start the uh, Docker server for the for the backend application, which is based on the microservices. So you can see that both the servers are up and running, and they'll be running in their respective IP addresses. So one double six eight six is for the uh, for the uh, Jaeger backend and 8081 was for the hot route. This is how the UI for the Jaeger looks like. And we'll cover the Jaeger UI in much more detail later on. But uh, meanwhile, we can quickly uh, hop on to the, uh, to the hot rod application, which is uh, right on demand. So if we see, uh, there's a web client ID 8102, which gets generated, and it's a unique ID. So for every request, uh, every request that comes in, it's a unique client ID. It's basically mapped to the customer. And then with this application, we can select the cap. So we'll select the Japanese desert. We can see that there is a car being allocated to us, which will be arriving in two minutes. Uh, there is a request, which is 8102-1 being mapped to our, to our client ID. And there is a latency of 728 milliseconds. So this latency is basically the overall latency over time it took from the time I click on the Japanese desert to book a cab, then it did some backend processing and it came back with a car that I've selected. So that's the overall time that has taken for the complete front end and the back end to happen. So we have generated one request and this one request should have now been stored in the uh, in the Jaeger backend. So we'll just go over to the uh, front end and refresh the page and you can see that uh, there have been some data which has been uploaded. So now we can see seven services there. Now we'll see how Jaeger can help us to uh, track the, the request that flows throughout the, the request path. So we'll go to the system architecture, then the AG, and then we have come to a graph where it says that the front end goes to the driver, front end makes another request to the customer, and the front end, which is our UI, makes a couple of requests couple of calls to the route. Uh, overall, there have been some, some 25 or 26 RPC calls, and these all have been illustrated in this diagram. So you can see front end made one request to the driver, which internally made 14 requests to the ready server. Then there was one request to the customer being made, and which ultimately landed into the MySQL server, and uh, MySQL would have done its own current operation, and it then gave back the results. So this is how you can get the overall flow of how your request being uh, passed through our application, through our uh, rights on demand uh, microservices, uh, rights on demand application, which is based on the microservice architecture. It also shows the number of requests being made, and like one, one and 10, so one for the driver, one for the customer, 10 for the route. We'll now go back to the Jaeger main UI and we'll quickly uh, show you how the Jaeger UI looks. So in this, you can see there's one request, 51 spans, three errors, one request for the customer, one for the driver, 24 for the front end, one for the MySQL, and 14 for the Redis. This is the overall summary of what has happened when we have just tried to book a one cab ride for us. If we click on that, you see, uh, the much more detail of how much time each individual request has taken for it to complete. So you can see there is my nearest driver that I'm currently hovering on. I'll, mean, uh, I'll go back to the first section which says front end. So when we have clicked on the front end, the first request was made to the customer, the second has been made to the find nearest. Uh, when, the find, when the customer endpoint was called, it ultimately landed into the SQL SQL, uh, SQL select. And that's because the MySQL made a query to retrieve the data about the customer. And similarly, the second uh, request was being made to find the nearest driver. So we get the details of get drivers, and we could see all the bunch of 
request being made for that particular uh, service. These are some of the time frames that it took uh, for this service to complete. Uh, so you can see a whole different range from 31.55 milliseconds to various other. If you want more detail into the, what has happened into the SQL select query, you can go ahead and click on that and uh, it'll show you much more details on that. So we'll get back onto that. Uh, Meanwhile, you can see all the different traces, uh, all the different requests being traced out. And these are the timestamps which can be used to uh, to find out what performance issues might have happened if, uh, if there is a lag in one of the requests. So we'll head on to the SQL select. Uh, so you can see the time taken by the SQL select, or you can say the time it took for the processing. We just click on that. And it shows us that the duration was 291.3 milliseconds on the on the right hand side. The request that that's there, that's 8102, was the same that that we have seen uh, while booking a cab in the hot rod application UI, and that's the same that gets uh, in the in the SQL select tax format that we are seeing. And this is the web client ID that we've been using. Uh, if we go to the tax, we see the request. We can also see the exact SQL query which was being used for the processing. So you can see it says select star from the customer where customer ID is 731. So this is all the extra information that we get uh, while while using the traces. So it not only adds the text, it also adds the logs. So if you go to the logs, you see that if there is an event that has happened which says acquire log with zero transactions waiting behind. So it's not only about the traces, it's not only about the events, it's also about the logs where we get some more detailed information about that. And then anyway, we have the 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 time diagram, time graph, which helps us to determine how much time each individual request has taken. It also carries some information about the host name, IP address, uh, Jagger version that has been used uh, in the application, which helps us to determine the overall uh, overall behavior and the architecture of the application that, that has happened. Uh, as part of the development. So this is not the, uh, like like I said, there, in this particular application, there was only one request being made, but the more requests you made, the more data it will have, and it will be more useful for you to understand what all has been happening in your application. So it's just a single, single request that we have made, and for that, there was all this bunch of requests, 51 spans that we've been talking about. The graph that you currently see has only one dot, and that's what we have explained now. Uh, if there are much more requests being made, you will see a lot more dots than, than a single dot. There will be a couple of more dots, and you can uh, explore any of those requests by just clicking on that. So that's how the, the performance is being tracked by the, by the open tracing. We can just go in any of the microservices. We can expand it. We can go into deep into that and uh, try to differentiate what all uh, applications or what all latency issues have been happening because of this. Uh, so with that, I will quickly move on to the next section that we have, which is the summary, summarizing of what all we have learned. So as part of uh, this entire, uh, uh, the entire introduction of open telemetry, we have seen how useful it is that by introducing another attribute, another feature of open tracing, we are able to identify the, the performance bottlenecks of our application. It's not only about the, the, uh, the, the logs, it's not only about the events, it's not only about the metrics, but it's also about how well uh, it goes while we are trying to incorporate observability entirely into our application. So like been saying, uh, observability is not just a good to have feature. It's just like in any other attribute that our system has. Uh, just like we have usability, we have stability, we have, uh, we want our system to be highly reliable, highly available. Similarly, the system must have all the observability section covered properly. Uh, the goal of the observability is to ensure that the services running in production are able to detect any unusual or undesirable behavior, such as error or any of the slow responses. It becomes easier for the 
for the developers for the uh, SREs to develop their distributed application because as the applications are getting used in the different hybrid cloud formats, uh, it's getting more and more uh, difficult for the for the developers to debug them. So with this, we can easily locate uh, where our application is spending more time and where there are bottlenecks that causing uh, the latency to increase. Uh, it also helps us to collect the errors and exceptions which are not otherwise uh, handled by our application. So it's not only about uh, some of the things that we can avoid. It also helps us to locate uh, some of the unknown behavior of our application that, that we were previously unaware of. So logs, events, and traces serve their own unique purposes, and they are complementary to each other. Uh, none of them can replace each other. They increase our visibility towards our complicated distributed application. We can add a log. Uh, at every major entry and exit point of a request, and a trace at every decision point of a request. It also makes sense to have all three semantically linked such that it, uh, it becomes possible at the time of debugging to reconstruct the path taken by the request. Such insights obtained uh, from the combination of different observability signals becomes a must to have a feature to debug the application. These are some of the references that you can refer to uh, explore more about it. So it's an open source project. You can go ahead and try contributing it. And the demo that we have used is also available in the GitHub uh, under the open tracing uh, public repository. So you can go ahead and tweak it uh, as you want. You can also try a, a sample demo to get a better understanding on that. And uh, since it's an open source, you can go ahead and raise your issues. You can have your own features built in and you can contribute into it. Uh, with that, we'll uh, conclude on the presentation. Uh, that's uh, that's what it's there in the open tracing in this presentation. Feel free to drop any question that you have. Thank you.
Faraz and Kiran. Hello, yes, this is Kiran. Uh, hi. So, so there's one question uh, uh, that says, any thoughts on how compliance and auditing is take in open telemetry? Um, so, so the auditing can be done. Uh, you, you can take care of auditing by uh, store and replay of the loss. Uh, we probably can use something like Elasticsearch or, or a database where uh, where the where the font can be stored and then uh, have have a UI like uh, Yakker where the loss can be, the fonts can then be replaced um, and the complaints can be built uh, uh, can be, it can build on top of the uh, the tracing API uh, just to make sure uh, the different services that take part in uh, our, in our application. Uh, actually comply to the standards that we mentioned, uh, that we follow. So, yeah, but those are some of the thoughts I can, can render on how uh, compliance and uh, Um, uh, yeah, please let us know if there are any further questions uh, we are here to answer, maybe for either of the minutes.
Right. Well, thank you very much for for you for attending this session and listening to us on on, on this talk. Um, I hope uh, we hope it was useful to you. Thank you very much.